Guys, 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 the library is open because we are doing a lot of reading today. Everyone and their mother in Russia decided to give lengthy interviews about how the past seasons and past experiences and when Alina Kostornaya talks about her future in pair skating. We're getting a lot of answers like what happened to Darius Oshova and Maya Kromik? We knew that they were both dealing with injuries, but we did not know how severe they were and why they have essentially vanished into thin air and we have yet to hear from them. Them, except from the possibility that Maya Kromik might actually be going to another country. It is rumored to be Italy. Why is that? We'll get a little bit of a clue. Evgenia shares a story that is supposed to be an embarrassingly funny story, but I don't know if she should be sharing it as casually as she thinks because it includes a literal slur. And we have Alina Kostornaya talking about her future in pairs and the romantic element since she is now dating her pairs partner. So we have a lot of reading to do and let's start with the beat and bones. So the reason why you're all here, the lengthy Terry Tutberitza interview, which mind you, she is famously a shadowy figure that stays away from the press until of course she wants to usually should talk somebody who's left her camp. But in this case, she's just recapping the past few seasons and giving us some answers, which are hard to come by from this woman. Although, keep in mind, it is coming directly from Materia Tutberitze, so we can't take everything as gospel. However, let's begin. The interviewer says, Eteri Gorvina, the season is almost over. Was it psychologically difficult to change to a format without international competitions? Eteri responds, we coaches and teachers understand that our athletes look up to us. It's like in a family. If something happens suddenly, the child always looks to the parent's reaction to understand how scary it is. Of course, with our attitude towards work, we try to maintain the level of motivation as if not to show that we're deprived of something and we continue to work. Now, they talk a lot about the problems of motivations among athletes, but it's not easy for coaches either. And I feel like we've noticed that Terry has been very much away from the spotlight this season. It doesn't add joy and subjective things, psychological pressure, a lot of dirt is poured against our team. Sorry. Here I am pouring more dirt. <laughs> it is not easy to create masterpieces in such an environment, but we are like a family. We experience it together. We take responsibility together. Responsibility since what? And help an athlete if they have a desire to be in sports. We didn't leave anyone unless they left you first, i.e. Kosornaya, Drutsova, Medvedeva at one point, etc., etc. <laughs> the interviewer says, perhaps it's a little easier for young athletes in this regard. Eteri says, Akatieva and Adalia Petrosian are not yet spoiled by international competition. Competitions. Each of them only has had two stages of the Grand Prix. But with Camila Valieva, it is a completely different story. When you go to an international competition over and over again, Grand Prix stages, Europeans, the Olympics, the attitude towards domestic competitions becomes slightly different. Only with the Russian nationals, it is different because you're qualifying for competitions. The interviewer says, so the season was incredibly hard for Camila. Hitari says, all things considered, yes. And none of us know what will happen next. Maybe it will be even harder, but we are able to keep her at the proper level. We kept the elements of the Ultra C and she showed her quad toe loops in the best way possible at the Russian Grand Prix final. She went to all competitions and became the first in the rating. God bless. While she has maintained a level of consistency, the triple axle is still a tough element for her. You can't see it in her eyes that she is losing motivation. She is at the top of her game in Russia and I think she just kind of wants to move to the next stage, but she's not allowed to because the Russians are banned. So I can see the frustration there for Camila, but also so she is at the epicenter of a lot of things, regardless of the Russian ban or not. So we don't even know if she would have been allowed at international competitions while the investigation is still underway regarding the positive tests at the Olympics. The interviewer continues saying, after the performance in St. Petersburg, she said it was very difficult for her to skate, that the memories of the pre-Olympic championship were a lump in her throat. Well, it, it was visible after the free program. And Terry says, after a short six minute warm up, something washed over her. She came off the ice and cried. She said, I can't skate here. We tried our best to set her mind. In general, she was much better prepared than we were able to show in the end. Well, who, if not me, knows that the constant pressure cannot be part of a habit. And let's not talk about it anymore. Interviewer says, let's move on to the results of the Grand Prix final. What task did you set for the Russian champion, Sofia Katieva, who, remember, is supposed to be the next Camila Olieva, the heir apparent, and the winner of the Grand Prix, Adelia Petrosian, who was right behind her, the two future stars of Terry Tutberitze, who, as previously mentioned, have yet to show what they're worth at international competitions. 
Terry responds, they had a task to try and skate with a new complicated content. We'd put two triple axles in the first half for Sofia Katieva and advanced the second quadruple toe loop to the second half, but she began to grow a little, and when this happens, the functional goes to zero. The body and the muscles do not have time, and the lung and heart are still very small. We thought to make the programs a little bit easier, but psychologically, it would be a step backwards. So how did Sofia overcome fourth place? Terry says, in a quiet working mode. There were a lot of mistakes, but in general, I want to say that I don't see the point of moaning over the results from competition to competition. I was not in perm, but I heard, for example, about the dissatisfaction. Sofia Murovieva had to win against Elisabetta Tukhtimisheva. These athletes have the same content, but Lisa, for so many years, is of course more competent, which means that you can beat her only with more difficult content. So scandal after scandal, judged unfairly here, underscored there, this very annoying during the season and distracting from the competitive mood. We also had enough of the judging injustices at the time. <laughs> judging injustices? You are known for having the Atari bonus. That's, I would argue, an injustice for anyone that's not under Atari, but go off sis. But our team never allowed itself to discuss the results of the competitions. I think it's a matter of upbringing and permissiveness. The interviewer for some reason says, then I will not ask you to comment on the scores of your athletes and return to the results of the Grand Prix. At a press conference, after the victory of 15-year-old Adelia Petrosian said the phrase, I went to do it for a very long time, which caused some to smile. Tutbritza says, but it's true. She was somehow underestimated in the components, but she was because she was small. Not by age, but by height. She's petite. For the Grand Prix final, we set the task for Adelia to make a flip and an axle in the second half. Her short program is very successful. I thought at the beginning of the season that she deserves higher scores. Everything coincided. Adelia herself, the costumes, and the skating. I know that if she skates well, she will gradually earn her components. She skates beautifully, jumps better, and is more consistent. And in training, she shows that she deserves high score. And in Emotional? Is this an advantage or disadvantage for the progress? Eterio Tudbritza says, so far, it hasn't helped. Oh god, little Adelia Petrosian. The interviewer says, have you already discussed the programs for the next season? Eterio Tudbritza says, she wants some samba or mamba, something fun. Let's see, she's very talented, but emotions really do not yet allow her to deliver the content that she could. For now, we are waiting to fully collect what we have. She collects all quads separately. Interviewer says, nothing was heard about Dasha, about Dario Soshova for a long time. It Terry Tutbritsa says. And before we see Terry's answer, let me prep you. If you don't remember, Dari Soshova was one of the worst injuries we had to see live. She went to a Grand Prix stage where she, in the warm-up, just doing a regular jump that she does all the time, it seemed like a persistent injury all of a sudden just snapped because she just went out of a jump and fell to the ground and started holding her hip in tears, yelling out in pain to the point where she had to drag herself out of the rink, limping, and then the sketchy doctor had to carry her out in his arms and of course a lot of people said there is no way that just happened without an injury being present and a lot of questions were raised about the fact that Tim Tutberitza knew or didn't know that she had this injury before taking her to this competition whether it was an issue that they had been warned by any sort of doctor a lot of ambiguity came around and that Isoshova had to come back home essentially in a wheelchair and we saw videos of her in training trying to get her jumps back elements back but nothing ever came of that. We saw her once, twice, and she was gone. So now, Terry gives us a little bit more detail from her perspective. She says, We tried to restore Dasha, Dario Sushova, for a very long time, but she began to jump and the pain returned. Remember, she had a hip injury, a hip fracture, a hip bruising. Whichever one, it's painful and takes a long time to recover. Perhaps this is a psychological moment. Phantom pains. What? <laughs> what are you talking about? Each time I sent her back to FMBA for consultations and examinations. She was with a variety of specialists, including Christian Schneider in Germany. It got to the point where the doctors no longer saw the reasons for the problems, but she still felt pain. I'm not a doctor, so it's hard for me to say what it is, but she can't jump. I'll tell you what it is. She's injured because she probably had a long-standing injury that was never treated properly and now when it snapped it was worse than ever possible because it was aggravated for a very long time. I'm not a doctor either, but I can kind of get the idea. Anyways. According to her content during the two pre-Olympic seasons, there is a feeling that there was a problem for more than one year. 
perhaps I am wrong, says the interviewer. Ateri replies, in fact, Darius Ochoa has already come to us with this problem. Oh, wow. Now she's saying that Darius Ochoa came to Ateri Tutbritze with this problem. She's been with them since she was like 13 or 12. For the last two or three years, as soon as she came to the training camp in Novogorsk and the loads began after the break, chronic pain appeared. We began to treat her, reduce the load, and so gradually and very carefully, we entered from season to season. So they knew this was a persisting issue. Therefore, we did not have the time to work on ultra C elements, which was always what kind of kept Daria back and away from real competition and qualifying for the Olympics because she didn't have any ultra C elements, no quads, no triple axles, unlike the rest of her competitors. And we were afraid that this would exacerbate her problem. Essentially, teaching her any ultra C elements would exacerbate her problem. However, we have seen her attempts at ultra C elements, so that obviously was happening. They were trying to teach her these elements. They weren't not doing it because they were afraid of her body breaking. Anyways, of course, we always took care of her. Dasha was under the control of doctors. Well, the last season traditionally started the same way, but usually the pain would go away at the beginning of the season. This time, the pain in her hip continued to bother her. So we know the pain is a thing. We know that it usually seizes, but this season it got worse and worse. Why was she still skating? Well, this is the answer. The interviewer asked something along the same line saying, so she shouldn't have gone to Japan for that ill-fated Grand Prix. Although, as I remember, Sasha Trusova withdrew from it then, and this, to some extent, increased Daria's chances. Remember, that was the pre-Olympic season or the Olympic season, however you see it. Essentially, everybody was trying to qualify for the three-slot team to represent Russia at the 2022 Olympics. Eteri says, of course, it was the Olympic season, and Dasha really wanted to use her chance. Two days before the departure, we had a conversation in which Daria's mother, the athlete, and the doctors were present. I was categorically against this trip to the competition because it seemed to me, visually, through her movements, that the pain had intensified. In this conversation, Dasha's mother insisted on her participation, and Daria herself cried and asked to give her a chance and not to withdraw from competitions. Her main argument was that the doctors would be there and that she would try to take care of herself. She didn't even train until the first six minute warm up. That tells me that she was in so much pain that she just said, I'm gonna be on the ice only when I have to. That is when you, as a coach, step in. And I know her mom was saying yes, but you are the coach. You know what the sport does to a young body, especially you should know. So that's when you step in and you tell them no. And I know you were categorically against it, but somebody in there had to put their foot down to prevent this from happening. But I guess you can't fight a, a parent. I don't know how the setup is there. Anyways. She didn't even train until the first six minutes of the warm-up. Everyone saw how it ended. For our part, we always try to give the athlete the maximum chance, but this time I myself regretted that I, I had not insisted on a complete withdrawal. So at least she's saying that she acknowledges that she should have put her foot down. So we're on the same page for once. Only recently in casual conversation, the doctors learned that her older sister, who was also involved in figure skating, retired exactly because of the same injury. Perhaps if we had known about this earlier, could have dealt with the problem differently, but we already can't change anything here. Now, I don't know anything about hip, hip injuries and genetics regarding hip injuries, but I find it weird and difficult to believe that a sibling or a parent or anyone blood related having a hip injury gives you a bigger chance of you having a hip injury, unless it's because it's based on the way your bones are shaped or something. I don't know, but saying that if only we had known that her older sister had the same injury, we would have treated it with more care. I see the argument. I don't know if the logic is logic. I'm not gonna lie. And also I doubt, I genuinely doubt that if they had known that, that it would have changed how anything had transpired. But who knows? Maybe I'm wrong and science says that hip injuries are genetically passed or something. I don't know. The interviewer says something that we did not know. There was information that she wanted to try ice dance. So allegedly, Dario Sochova wants to try ice dance. And Terry says she had a tryout with Dario Cristiano, but she needs to look for someone with whom she can learn. And Dario needs a partner with whom he can already compete. Dasha believes that she will succeed in dancing. She must try to move on. That one seemed a little ominous. I don't know if she meant she must try to move on away from figure skating or she must try to move on from single skating into dance. 
who knows? And here is where we get to the part that shocked me the most. The fate of Maya Kromik. The interviewer says, and Maya Kromik? It seems that she has recovered and then disappeared from sight again. Eteri says, we restored shape, a quadruple jump, and then a terrible arm injury. And this is where I went. What? What? what how did she also break her arm four different times like Ayuna Kostornaya? No. It's way freaking worse, Eteri explains. From the initial position of the short program, she made one push, stumbled, and then caught the toe picks of her ice skate with her left hand. It missed the ice and the toe picks hit her arm. I don't even know how your toe picks reach all the way back to your arm. You're like, that's some unnatural shaping of the body. Eteri says it ended very badly. There was a big loss of blood and convulsions. What? She was taken away by ambulance and then there was surgery and not immediately the doctors postponed it for a day to invite a special neurosurgeon because the so complicated this injury was because the injury was so complicated i what how has this never been reported how is this possible i just don't understand first physically how it happened and also the fact that this is now also in the track record of things that have happened to tutperitza girls it's not just eternal injuries from the sport that leave you you know not being able to twist your back it's convulsions what this is insane. I think this is some sort of freak accident because I don't even understand the dynamics of it. Terry continues saying, it took us a very long time to return after all of this. It took a long time to remove the cast. There was a cast. So she broke her arm too on top of like having a really deep cut. Like, I don't even know. It took a long time to develop the arm and Maya could not lift it even 45 degrees from her hip. So she lost mobility too. That's insane. During this time, unfortunately, she gained weight. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> she just can't help herself, can't she? But she returned to the ice and started to skate. It is impossible to fight both loads and weight at the same time. It is dangerous for the back. Oh my god, her poor back. The arm is gone, the mobility is gone, and then the back. Now she does not jump yet. She skates wearing a corset now because of the back problem. It so happens that Maya has a test after a test. <sighs> oh my god. Like... I know figure skating is a dangerous sport and I genuinely think this sounds like a freak accident, but the fact that it happened under the pressure cooker that is Team Tutoritza cannot be a coincidence. Know what I mean? Like, this girl was trying so hard to nail whatever jump she was trying to nail, whatever move, whatever element that she pushed through and then this happened. And Jesus, I just hope she is okay because what a horrible way to end your career. And if the rumors are true that she's trying to transfer herself to another country, rumored to be Italy, I hope that she is in a better environment where they truly put her bodily safety first and having these previous injuries, she is more cautious with how far she's willing to push her limits to physically. Jesus Christ, that's insane. It doesn't end because now we're going to talk about Daniel Samsonov. Danny Samsonov's path in sports is not easy either, says the interviewer. Everyone remembers him as a child who barely was visible behind the board and now he is already 17 years old. It dares you to be says he had a hard time recovering from surgery from one of his knees but as soon as he returned to competitions the other knee began to bother him it was also operated danya's rehabilitation process has already passed and now he's recovering we have already returned all triples and i really hope that we will be able to perform a miracle with him and reach a worthy competitive level all i'm gonna say is that the saying a terry breaks boys is there for a reason and we need to now make it gender neutral because a terry pushes limits to when the the body breaks. I don't know, that doesn't have the same ring to it, but this is insane. The interviewer continues, the high profile theme of the season was the arrival of Italian Daniel Grassl to the Crusoni. If you don't remember, this is Italian Daniel Grassl. He all of a sudden decided to join Team Tutberitze. He had a lot of backlash and then his first competition under Team Tutberitze was not a great one. And Terry says, he had been contacting us for a long time. About two years ago, he wanted to come here with a coach, but I was not ready to share my experience with another specialist. Then we met with him again, this time in Boston, where he trained. He's a very good guy and he's in search. And to his credit, it was quite hard for him to come here to another country. We try to help him as much as we can. <laughs> oh God, if Daniel Grassl does not better himself, Team Tutberitza is gonna throw him under the bus so quick, I can feel it. The interviewer says, it was not easy for him at the European Championships because of the increased attention. And Terry says, I would even say 
anti-attention. Daniel at some point really fell into a depression from the endless criticism. And I think I said this in the video where I talked about him moving to Team Tobritze saying that you really shouldn't reach out to him in DMs and like say shame on you because that does nothing. It won't change the reality of things. He knows who he's going to and you're just sending negativity his way. He made his choice, blind ambition, but it's now up to him to make his own decisions. So please, please don't go flooding somebody's DMs or adding them on Twitter because it won't do anything to change it and he knows where he's going. That's all I'll say. If for two years he was trying to get there, he's in the business. He knows what figure skating for Team Tuberitze would be like. The interviewer says, well, Grass will stay with you for a long time. And Terry says, well, I cannot make predictions. We did not make long-term plans. He trains, works, and prepares for the World's Championship. The interviewer says, you do not want to share your experience with Daniel's coach, but at the same time, many athletes from abroad have trained and train within your team. And Terry says, I've always been very close in terms of sharing experience with other specialists. This only happened a few times when I took Sergei Dudakov to the team and when Daniel Gleikenhaus came to us and we became one. Yeah, Yes, I am jealous about sharing my experience with other professionals, but we really coached and are coaching, including athletes who compete from other countries. Lisa Turzimbaeva competed for Kazakhstan. That's the one that, that beat Evgenia during the 2019, I believe, World Championships. And she also had to get back surgery and was never seen again after that season. She was as dear to us as everyone else. And then Morisi, who competes for Georgia, but apparently, allegedly, left Russia to train abroad because he's still allowed at competitions while well, the Russians are not. And now he's accompanied by another coach that is none of the team Dutbritze. No Dudakov, no Glackenhaus, no Ateri. And then Nika Egadase has been skating with us all their lives. The interviewer says, just a couple of days ago, information about a new project appeared on the web. A series of master classes abroad with your participation. The news caused different opinions. Ateri says, this is what we're talking about now. We are artificially deprived of the opportunity to work at an international level and suddenly there is a chance to do something new let it be through master classes why not i think it's time for that as far as i know the idea belongs to alexander lekernik the former vice president of the international skating union and this is a private project with private funds our team was entrusted with the conducting the first series of master classes the next ones will be conducted by other specialists i think that this is to some extent a way out not only for russian figure skating but for all figure skating we must try to move forward in any situation so Team Dutbris is going to try and make more of some bank money through master classes, which they've done in other countries, I believe European countries, and they did one in Mexico. So that was a lot to take in. I am still very shocked about Maya Kromink especially, and then Darius Shoshova's journey regarding just how much knowledge they had about this injury, that it was persistent for years before, and that that particular season, it was so bad that she decided she was only going to skate the warm-up and the competition. That is insane level of pain for you to not even prep beforehand and practice before a grand prix stage and the fact that she still with the support of her mother allegedly went to this competition and nobody put her foot down it just it just makes you think it could have been prevented so easily because all the red flags were there and people including daria and her mother allegedly chose to ignore them just for the chance and the fact that this injury got so aggravated is probably because of overworking over jumping over training whatever you want to call it it's it's a lot <laughs> this is a lot and i'm surprised that we got so many details and get ready because there's still two more interviews to get to the next one we're going to read is about evgenia Medvedeva. this one kind of went viral for a very different reason not because it was a serious serious topic but because a slur was involved so evgenia Medvedeva told the story which i think she wants it to be interpreted as like hilarity ensues because i am bilingual and was just learning the language which yes that is true as someone who's bilingual i can attest sometimes you say things i didn't know that ass was a bad word and i was yelling it at the zoo and all the parents were looking at me crazy because i was talking about a giraffe's ass because it was waving its little tail being funny and all the kids were like ass and the parents were like can you please not say ass in front of my child i was like I thought ass and butt were at the same level. Anyways, Evgenia Medvedeva had a similar situation with the, what we call the LGBTQ or the gay slur. The F word, let's call it that. And not 
the one you're thinking about, the other one. Evgenia says, a few years ago, I was training in Canada. This was when she was under Brian Orser, <laughs> who is gay. And she says, when I first got there, my English was not fluent. I had to think very hard before I said something. There were no practice. It was the second week of my stay in Canada. I was learning to communicate with people and I went to an additional training in the gym. Our group had a very cool physical training coach, but he forgot about me at some point. He forgot to put me on the schedule. He looks at me and he asks me, are you training today? And I say, yes, today. He stands, looks at me, and I understand that he just forgot about me. And there are two very similar words. There is forgot, and then there is got. And I look at him with a playful look and I say, oh, you. F and so we parted on that note that he forgot and I didn't know English. And I said that he was a got. Then it turned out that he was very, he had a very vulnerable soul. <laughs> I will say, it doesn't take a vulnerable soul to take offense to that word, Evgenia. He did not talk to me for over a week, and he looked at me askance, I'm guessing not in a pleasant way, that forgot and F got are two very completely different words, and then I turned red and I went to his training, but what won't you do for the sake of results? So I had to endure a little bit of cringe. <laughs> I hope she apologized as well and explained the situation. Yeah, this happened. It went a little bit viral. I saw it everywhere and I was like, wait, what? Because <laughs> the, the title was just like, Evgenia Medvedeva calls her previous physical trainer a F word. And I was just like, oh wow, what what is going on today? Well, with that silly little story, or was what's meant to be a silly little story, we now get into Ayano Kosornaya, who is, unlike Ter Terry Tutberidze, known very much for being very open and explaining all of her feelings, putting it out there exactly how she feels. And she has given us a lot more content as she often does. You're a queen, never change, keep at it. So the interviewer says, in November of 2022, you assumed that one day you would switch to pair skating, but you weren't sure yet. And in January, it was officially announced. Was it a spontaneous decision? Aliona Costornaya says, back in October, as soon as I left the hospital, because Aliona also underwent hip surgery, hip surgery, hip surgery and breaking her arm four times. Get that in your head. <laughs> I will never get over it. I messaged Elen Elena, Germa Elena Buyonova that I was ready to do both. This was the coach that she went to in CSKA after leaving Team Tutbritze. I needed to learn pair elements for the show. And then at some point, I realized that I had more prospects in pair skating. It took me a month to decide. All the right people knew from the beginning, but it was too early to tell officially. The interviewer says, how is the work going? He says, where is more comfortable already? In pairs or still in singles? Aliona responds. As a single skater, the desire to go and jump all the time does not leave me, especially if something does not work out. But when I'm not alone, we need to try everything together. At such moments, a nightmare begins because it gets better and better all the time. I am not the same as I was in the beginning. What elements can you already do consistently? Ayuna says. We do spins, side-by-side -side jumps, and double throws as well. I'm still falling from the triple ones. We do a double twist on the floor. We tried a triple. It's also good. Not excellent, as if we had been training for 10 years, but tolerable. Interviewer says, in 2020, you explained the return from Evgeny Plushenko to Ateri Tutberitze as follows. I don't perceive a male authority for me. It is not an authority. I rely more on life experience, some knowledge or something else, and not on patriarchy. <laughs> now your coach is a man. What changed? <laughs> Why do all these interviewers love reading back Aliona Costornaya's own quotes back to her and saying, eat your words right now? <laughs> Like, what? This is like the third time it happens to her. Ayana Costanera responds, Well, on some issues, I still need a feminine look. For example, I discuss a new costume with Bettina Popova and not with Sergei Ryaskov, which I'm guessing is her new coach. At the same time, now I perceive the coach more as an assistant, a person who wants me to become better and achieve results. It's my business whether to listen to him or not. <laughs> Costanera, dear, according to sources, you've always been that way. <laughs> the interviewer says, How did you perceive them before? Costanera says, As a a person who will stand over me with a stick and force. If that is not a subtweet to a Terry Tutperitze, I don't know what is. Interviewer says, it seems that everyone has already spoken about your prospects in pair skating. What do you think? Alina Kostornaya says, there are chances. We need to use them. A few years ago, you said that you dreamed of the Olympics. Do you still have such thoughts, but already in pair skating? Kostornaya says, sure. I just wanted to be there. My mother told me, even if you open the board there and shout to me through the skiing, mom, I got to the Olympics. 
Olympics, then I will already be happy for you. And if I also skate there, it will be great. But these are dreams. Whether it succeeds or not is another question. Only time can show. This confirms to me my suspicions from other interviews as well that Ana Costanaya has a major stage mom because the way she talks about her mother and how emotional she reacts to any decisions and now saying just how happy her mom would be for her at the Olympics is giving a little bit of a stage parent situation, but who knows. Interviewer says, Ana Shabakova says she's afraid to even watch pair skatings, not to mention try it. Do you not have this fear? Costornaya responds, Sometimes I post videos of my pair elements to chat with the girls from single skating and they ask if I'm scared, but I'm fine. Something may be uncomfortable or unusual, but I can't say that this causes a protest in me or that I have to persuade myself. That doesn't surprise me because Costornaya does not fear a Terry Tutbrit herself. She does not fear breaking her arm multiple times trying different jumps. This girl is fearless. She she said to Team Dutbrice, say it to my face. Interviewer is also impressed and says, when was the last time you were scared in your life? Costornaya responds, it is usually associated with planes. For some reason, our flights from Italy are always terrible. How many times we flew there, everything is fine, but back, terrible. Once we landed, we already started to stop and then suddenly accelerated and took off again at a very low speed. I thought that I was about to turn gray. It was very scary. Or we fell into air pockets that were pressed to the floor. I thought it was the end. I also have claustrophobia, but I only feel it in an MRI machine. I start shaking panic with tears. Interviewer says, you have been posting a lot of photos with Georgi Kunitsa lately. What reaction did you expect from the fans when you made the relationship public? This is her Paris partner and boyfriend. Kostornaya says, usually when you post photos with a hint of some kind of relationship, everyone immediately starts writing and saying that this is the end of the career. Probably a quarter of all messages were about this. At first, such comments offend and you think, what can these people do? Nothing. This is my Instagram and I post what I want. Well said. Do you think this is any business? Is it useful to work side by side with a partner? Romantic partner, he means. Kostodaya response is very individual. I won't name names, but in figure skating, there were cases when it really hindered some pairs. What was the craziest thing you did? Kostodaya says, I don't think I've ever done really crazy things. I really want to bungee jump in Sochi, but I'm so forbidden. At first I was too young, then there has to be a surgery, and now after surgery, it is also impossible. They say it's more interesting than skydiving. By the way, I haven't tried this either. <laughs> the interviewer says, you're often the most extraordinary figure skater in Russia. How do you feel about this? <laughs> I feel like extraordinary there was used with a little bit of shade. Kostonaya responds, I like it because at some point it is my goal to be different from everyone and I get it. Of course sometimes these stories around me are overblown. I am a public person so all my actions including mistakes are given great publicity and sometimes if you figure it out I don't do anything special. It's like the scandals around Olga Busova. Well a person who had to fight with someone. Who cares? But she is famous so everyone is discussing. It. At the same time, I definitely like to be the first, and I am pleased that they repeat after me. This applies to the changes in appearance and sports. For example, at competitions, when I put the stickers on my face, naturally before me, this was done at some concerts, but in figure skating, no. Or there was a situation at the show recently. I flew on a loop, you accelerate, you're lifted and then lowered. You need to do a couple of acrobatic elements. After some time, other athletes already tried it. As my friend says, no one steals bad ideas. Interviewer asks, is the desire to create a daring image something that you have always had since childhood? Costornaya says, no, it always comes with age. I used to be taught not to stand out too much. If you stand out, then only with something very good. And when I got older, I realized that any PR excitement around you is not bad. But if the occasion is good, it is doubly pleasant. <laughs> Costornaya truly said, no PR is bad PR. <laughs> I am a very difficult person and I was a difficult child. My mother tells me something and I think about my behavior and I say, I would kill for this. Sometimes I work with children and I have been creating programs for two years now. I understand that I won't be able to endure such a child as I was in childhood. There were always some problems. I could run somewhere and forget what I needed to be done setting up a lot of people. How did the coaches agree to work with me? How did Elena lead me from a young age of 7 to almost 13 years old? And we still managed to succeed. We're on good terms now and I can turn to her on any issue. This is the coach before Team Tutberitze. Notice how she didn't say Team Tutberitze? <laughs> she cannot turn to them for any issue. That is not good terms from what I read between the lines there. The interviewer says, is such character in sports good or bad? Elena Kosunaya says, if you send it in the right direction, then it's good. I don't think I've fully come to this yet. 
only a couple of years ago, I began to approach work more consciously. I learned to force myself. I can work by myself without control. The coach does not have to stand over me. And before that, it was like this. There is no coach in training. You can do nothing. The motivation was more material. If I win something, I can buy something for myself with prize money. Were there any moments in which a lack of endurance prevented you from achieving something? Costonaya says, no. There were no global emissions precisely because of my character. Perhaps in some separate training sessions. I could have achieved more if I had not started to sob or cry in hysteria when something went wrong, but these are isolated cases. By and large, it did not affect my results. Such moments, of course, I would like to minimize. The only thing I regret is the Olympics, but I did not get there because of a broken arm. With a plaster, no matter how much you want, you can't jump. It hurts even if you don't move your arm. Well, it's a pity about the world championships, but there was a quarantine. Again, not my fault. And if you think about it, she's right. The two moments where honestly, it would have been all on her, the universe kind of gave her an out because the world where she was slated to win everything, the 2020 worlds, quarantine began. The pandemic happened. And so even though she says she believes she wouldn't have won it because she was in bad condition, she'll never know. And then the Olympics, she broke her arm. So no matter how much she tried, she doesn't know if she actually had a genuine chance to be in the Olympic team. I don't think she would have made it there just based on the way she was skating and the press she was getting, but she'll never know. So for her, those two things will always be an F. She looks at it as a positive that it was out of her control. And I agree. I think it's true and good to look at it that way. Interviewer says, what is the most valuable medal for you? Except for the gold from the European Championships. Kosonoya says, it is impossible to single out one. Each is valuable in its own way. It is always fight, tears, and joy. What period in your sports career at the moment is the most difficult? Kosonoya says, it is very hard every time I enter the competition after changing the coach. An incredibly oppressive atmosphere. Constant questions. Everyone is waiting for something and wanting something from you. I tried to ignore it all, but it didn't help. No matter how strong you are in public, at home, alone with yourself, you are broken. Of course, the coach supports you, but you don't need to dwell on this. This is a very personal story. I started figure skating at the age of four. What would you say to that four-year-old girl if you had the chance? What is this, RuPaul? <laughs> what would you say to little Aliona Costornaya? Aliona Costornaya says, you're doing everything right, go your own way, but don't forget to listen to your loved ones. I find that a very adorable way to end this video and also this interview. Aliona Costornaya, I think, is probably one of the ones who is the most, not just outspoken, but maybe self-reflective about her journey in figure skating because she realizes how crazy it is. To this day, I am shocked at just how outspoken and straightforward she was in that one interview when people were like, but you got medals. And she was like, at what cost? Because it's what everybody else outside of Russia says about Team Tutperidze. She's the only one that has said it straightforward. Evgenia, you know, she talks about it here and there about how age will always stop you no matter what you do. You have to choose your mental health eventually. You just can't keep doing it. But she never really outright wants to make an enemy out of Team Tutperidze in terms of calling them out over their overtraining practices and just how much damage mentally and physically it does to their girls. But also she's still under Team Tutberitze and now the Team Tutberitze or I don't even know if Team Tutberitze but Terry Tutberitze herself is planning to put her energy in more international projects like master classes and training international students like Daniel Grassel. I think her attention is at an all-time low for her current students, which makes me feel really bad about Delia Petrosian and Sofia Kateva, but also makes me think that she has even less of a connection for her previous students, like Evgenia Medvedeva, Alina Sagitova, and Anna Shibakova. And these are students that are not even out of her umbrella organization that is Team Tutberitze. They're still under her. She still gets a cut from whatever they do in terms of figure skating activities, but they've all essentially retired into the entertainment business. And she's focusing on getting motivation back. I think the way she talked about everything is kind of like, eh, what are you gonna do? You need to move forward. And I think her moving forward is, one, her daughter, focusing on getting her set up and ready for success elsewhere in another federation, under another flag, another country. But also, kind of until the ban is lifted, she's just gonna find different ways to make money internationally. She's thinking now as a businesswoman and as a coach, which we also come in just because Team Tutberitze LLC is now bigger than competitions themselves. And winning competitions does not give her the clout it used to. Her reputation has 
taken a severe hit, which I think the Camila thing made it even worse. And then the ban essentially kneecapped it. So Eteri's kind of retreated into herself. Costornaya is going into pairs with the attitude of someone who has not broken this many bones and had hip surgery. She's extremely optimistic, not scared at all. And she's just like, I'm here. I'm having fun. <laughs> and we love to see it. And then Evgenia Medvedeva is just an influencer. Alina Sagitova and Anna Shabakova on that same influencer path. Hedelia Petrosian and Sofia Kateva are still striving so hard to be the best within Team Tutperitze. When I feel like Team Tutperitze is not even a thing anymore. Does anyone else feel that? Feel like this is the end of the chapter, the end of an era, that we're turning a new leaf? Because the moment they're not dominant anymore, as soon as that international ban is lifted, whoever sees this, whether it is Pushenko or someone from CSKA, they can become an equal, powerful camp in terms of turning out talent because people are just feeling fatigued. And I'm not gonna lie, I'm feeling fatigued a bit with figure skating in general. So I can't even imagine how they are feeling in terms of how it feels meaningless for them doing all these competitions when there is no exceptional reward. And it's towards the end of the season, which is why I think I'm feeling fatigued. So there was a lot to register in there. I still don't really know what to make of Evgenia's story. Like, it is kind of funny, but it's also kind of like, a, what, girl? Did you know what you were saying? <laughs> did you not know? How did you learn? Who explained it to you? <laughs> is there an equivalent Russian word? There's so many questions. Um, Daria and Maya, I think, are the biggest revelations here. What the hell? The future of, of Team Tutberitze, I think, is sealed in my eyes. It's kind of over, and it's going out, not in a bang, but in a small sizzle, slow slowly, gradually. And Costornaya is just here to have fun. I really don't think she has great aspirations for pairs. I just think she wants to stay in the sport. And like she said, no press is bad press. Any press is good press. I don't really remember how to say that. But yeah, let me know what impacted you the most. How do you feel about the future of Eteri Tutberitze? How do you feel about the future of the Russians back in the Olympics? Is that even going to happen ever? Is the IOC ever going to give us an answer? We don't know. And as always, shout out to my VIPs. Let's go. Karina, Katie, Timothy, Natalia, Leslie, Tori, and V. As always, thank you so much for the support. Twitter, merch, and Patreon are all down below. And I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.